and get sharing the screen. So do that will be still in the advanced process control? Pardon me? The POC will be still belongs to advanced process control? No, it's in control systems. Can we see the PowerPoint now? Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, we got her. Yes. All right. So this is uh, step one, I guess, introduction to programmable uh, logic controllers. Uh, you guys, if I recall correctly, do a little bit of this kind of stuff in second year. So a lot of the stuff I think that you're going to see today, hopefully, will be a little bit of review. Um, but let's see what we're up for. So today's objective says learn PLC ladder logic programs that use timers and counters. So if I'm correct, when you were in second year, you guys did some relatively basic PLC programming, just on and off type of stuff with switches. I don't know if you got into timers and counters or not, but that's what we're going to get at here in this ILM. Uh, the first caveat that I'm going to make about the ILMs moving forward is that the addressing format that they lay out in this ILM is, is meant to be a generic kind of format. Um, in our lab, we have uh, Logix 5000 system and we have a Delta V system and they have uh, similar but slightly different addressing. Uh, the concepts are the same, but you will notice that when we get to our actual hardware that we have at Red Deer Polytechnic, that the addressing is somewhat different. Uh, theoretically and conceptually, they're kind of the same, but that's the only kind of caveat. And you'll find out uh, pretty soon that uh, what the real addressing looks like. Question? Do you have any um, PLC or DCS student version we can download for learning purpose? You can go to the Alan Bradley site and they would have a bunch of stuff. There's also some stuff in the course content section of the course, as well as some videos uh, of the lab procedures in the course content package as well that you can review if you want to look at it. And I am trying to see if I can get you guys remote access to the lab um, so that you can kind of get in there and play around a little bit, but I'm not sure how to do it. I've never done it, but I'm pretty sure that we can. So I'll let you know how that develops. Sounds great. Thank you. All right. So let's get at her. Uh, we'll start out here looking at some basic ladder diagram programming and some of the uh, IEC 611.31-3 standard diagrams. So all the programming languages that we look at are covered by the IEC under the 611.31-3 standard for PLC languages. Um, I guess I should almost start out the day with something like uh, bonjour, buenos dias, uh, buongiorno, I don't know how many other ways to say good morning, but essentially in fourth year here we're going to be looking at five uh, different programming languages that are all covered under this IEC, IEC 611 311-3 standard. Um, and it is not different than trying to learn Spanish or French or Italian or some other language. It can be very complicating uh, to, a, to someone who has no experience with it. Um, but just like all of those languages, if you're going to go down to uh, Mexico on a holiday, for example, uh, you might not know anything as you board the plane here in Alberta, but by the time you're boarding the plane uh, in Mexico to come back home, you've probably got a general idea of how to, you know, ask for the bathroom and where to get a beer and things like that. So we're going to get you a pretty rudimentary basic understanding of the five different languages. Uh, you are in no way going to become an expert in any of these languages, probably. Um, but that's the idea of the course here is kind of get your toes wet in the programming water. So ladder diagram, probably the most common or has been historically the most common programming language uh, that has been used. It's, I guess, 
probably, and I'm not really in touch with industry anymore, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say that function block programming is probably surpassing ladder diagrams uh, pretty soon if it hasn't already. Um, but there will always be a, a spot for uh, all of the different languages, and you'll see uh, you'll see why uh, as we go through some some of these languages: ladder diagram, function block, sequential function chart, structured text. Uh, have specific applications where they do work better than other languages. So we'll see that as we as we progress through the course here. But for now, we're just going to start out with the basic building blocks. So what we have on the screen here are, are really the three basic building blocks for a ladder uh, diagram or ladder programming. Uh, this should be review uh, for, for all of you who have, who have done second year. But our, our basic symbols here, the exam and on symbol, the exam and off symbol, and the energize output symbol. And we'll be using these quite extensively as we go forward here. And hopefully you have a uh, basic understanding of, of how these uh, work here. Addressing, of course, direct addressing refers to a physical address as part of our I.O. system. Uh, we have a, a rack, a backplane set up with a different number of uh, I.O. modules set into it. Each of these I.O. modules in a, in a representative slot or location in that backplane, which becomes uh, numbered. And again, very generically, but this does apply for the system that we have here. Generally, you have your uh, master controller or CPU in slot zero, and then your I.O. Uh, installed in random slots wherever you kind of want to put them in the, in the back plane. Once you have it in a slot, it gets, an, it gets a slot address. And then once you start putting your I.O. actually into the different channels, you will get channel addresses, which in this case will represent the bit number in this addressing format. So the address that we're showing at the top of the screen here, I30.04, the I will represent an input card. The 30 represents slot three, and the four here will represent the fourth channel of that card. So if we were looking at that particular uh, card, the input card in slot 30 and channel number four or bit number four, in this case, it's showing a one. So there's a contact out there in the field somewhere that's made that has turned this into a one. Uh, it varies a little bit between manufacturers, but they're all generally the, the same, same idea. You're going to have an identifier for the type of card it is, input or output card, uh, a number that represents the slot, and a number that represents the particular channel uh, on a card that your I.O. is connected to. First off here, we have the exam and on instruction. So the exam, exam and on instruction here is the one without the line. And basically what the system is doing is it's going to go through uh, and scan all the I.O. points in the, in the hardware that we have, and it's going to be looking for ones or zeros. In the case of an exam and on instruction, if it does a scan of the I.O. card, and in this particular case in uh, slot number, or sorry, channel number six of the I.O. card, it's looking and it sees a one. If it sees that one, that means that the exam and on instruction would be true. And this would light up on our program diagram. If it scans an I.O. point and it sees a zero, it's going to say that this instruction is false and it will not change color in the program. And that's the basic exam and on instruction. The exam and off instruction, which is the next one, has the line through it here. And it is essentially, and not essentially, it is the opposite of the exam and off instruction. If it scans the card and it sees a one in the slot, it's going to say that it's false. And if it sees a zero in the space, it's going to say that it's true. So in this case, the zero would light up this bit in our program. The one would not. So this is like saying if the switch is not closed, then the answer would be true. So examine off and examine on are the two basic ones. And this is one of those things where even after 30 years of looking at this stuff, uh, you hear examine off or examine if open or examine closed, et cetera, et cetera. There's always that 50-50 chance that you get your thinking backwards in how they work. Um, but basically, um, once you get it straight in your head, uh, back to the examine on instruction here. I was looking at the examine 
technical instruction saying that in the field, somewhere in the field, there's a switch that is closed. And if that switch closes, it creates a one and it turns this bit on or changes the color of this bit. If that switch is open, it doesn't close the bit and this remains neutrally colored. And the opposite again with a false instruction. So a typical application of start stop station, for example, um, will have the uh, one switch uh, stop one way and the start switch the other way. So one of them will be green, one of them won't be green. When you press the stop button, they will they will flip and flop and you'll see how that looks as we go on. And I'm assuming at this point that you've had this experience before and this is review. Okay, the third primary uh, instruction is the output energized instruction, instruction here and this usually goes at the end of a run and once a certain number of conditions or bits are uh, satisfied or become true, it will energize the output at the end of the rung. So a zero, of course, will be a zero, meaning that the, out, the output of the rung is not true and our output would not be energized. And if we have a one, and you'll notice here on the output card where our address has changed now from an I.30, which would in, indicate an input card, to a O.40, which would indicate an output card in the fourth slot of that rack, and then channels five and channels two, as the addresses would lead you to be here too. So if everything in the rung is satisfied, I've got green, 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 it would be a one, and this would light up. And if I have green, not green, this would be a zero, and this one would not light up. And as we go through here, you'll get lots and lots of practice uh, understanding what's going on. Okay, so the way that the system works, of course, is we have uh, inputs and outputs in the field, and we have our I.O., and then within the I.O., we have our uh, controller that does all the programming actions where the program resides. So the scan cycle does three basic steps. The first steps, the inputs are updated in the I.O. image table. So we read the outputs, we say, is the switch open? or is the switch not open? And as they open and close out in the field, the, the ones and zeros uh, within the control system will change in real time. So as they change, they will, uh, they will automatically update. So the, the scan cycle will then read those inputs. They will execute the ladder diagram program. It will update any changes that have occurred because something on this side has changed and then it'll adjust the outputs accordingly. So a switch gets closed, for example, it'll change this to switch close, it changed the IO table, that'll make this run true. It'll then adjust the output or energize this particular output, and then it'll continue to do that over and over again. And this is hundreds, if not thousands of times per second. So this is a scan cycle. It reads the inputs, runs the program, adjusts the outputs, and then continuously doing this. So this leads us to our basic first uh, little ladder diagram. Um, looking at a scan cycle or what we just talked about in a scan cycle here, I want you to think about what happens when the hand switch number one closes. So here you have hand switch number one connected to the digital input card, which is located in slot three of our rack, and the switch itself is connected to channel number four. The switch is open right now. So if we're looking at an operating program, this would look just like it does right now, as with this. Neither one of them would be energized. We close the switch. The I.O. table in the card changes from a 0 to a 1 because this is an examine open and it's looking for that 1. It says, hey, there's a 1 here now. I'm going to turn green. This will update the output table saying that this run is now green. That means that we can turn on this output. The output will turn on green and it will energize uh, a light. So if, hopefully we have no questions there. Any questions at this point? Okay, just to talk about the examine off instruction. If this was an examine off instruction that had uh, a line in here, and I don't know if I can do this easy or not, if I had a line in there like that, the old examine off, as it sits right now, this switch is open. And in the examine off situation, that means that the bit itself would be a one, 
So that means that this would be green right now and the output would be energized. So not an important fact, you know, but uh, you'll see it as, as that goes along. Oops, I don't want to do that. There we go. So back we are. Next diagram here. Oh, sorry. So when we're dealing uh, within uh, a program here, we have different types of data. Uh, the example that we looked at uh, so far has just been a Boolean uh, data type, which means that it's either on and off, and that's what we do associate with discrete I.O. points, so discrete input and discrete output modules. It's either a switch that's on or off, or it's an output that's either energized or not energized. Then we have other data types. So integer type data type gives us a range of values from negative 32,000 to positive 32,000. And we use this for analog type devices. Digital or uh, d -ins, or another type of integer value, uh, a whole number value that has no decimal point. A real type number here is also uh, a big number, not common, not too commonly used, but also used for analog uh, input and output modules. And then we have timer type data. Um, and the timer, of course, operates on a 24-hour type, type clock, and this is used to indicate time. So these are the ones that we're kind of going to be uh, using. Most of the ones uh, that we see are either going to be Boolean, integer, or timer numbers, at least in this ILM as we start out here. It takes a lot more than a 10-week course uh, to become familiar with all of the things that we're going to discuss. but. Uh, the main thing here at this point is to kind of introduce you to the different types of things that you can see on a very broad scale. All right, starting uh, our first type of new function. I don't think you guys dealt with timers in second year. Is that safe to assume? Can anyone speak to that? No takers? I don't, uh, I don't remember timers, but I, I'm pretty sure I dealt with it with uh, electrical for sure. Yeah, you would have had this in your basic electrical uh, control system type theory section too. But all right, so uh, first thing that we're going to look at here is called an on delay timer. And as the name would suggest, uh, when the timer receives a signal, it has a delay of a preset amount of time before we energize the output of the timer. So although this is a very generic sort of timer block, the different systems that we use, whether it's a, a logic system or a delta V system, they'll look, they'll look different. Uh, the ones that we use don't look exactly like this. They don't have different uh, letters to describe what's going on with them, but the function of them is generally all the same. So just kind of keep that in mind as, as we go along. So timer one, for example, uh, T on, this will be found in uh, the software package uh, and we'll do that later in the lab, but it's, uh, it's part of the number of components that you can pick and choose from when you're doing uh, different programming. So some of the things that we have here, uh, arguments. So all of these points, we'll call them arguments. So in the in argument here, it's a Boolean data types, meaning that it's a discrete signal coming in. And if it's true, this is a true, so whatever's in front of this is green, it basically turns on the timer and the timer starts increasing its counting. If it's false, it stops and resets the timer. So if I make this positive, the timer starts counting. One, two, three, four, et cetera, et cetera. And it'll keep counting up to uh, a program time that we, that we enter into the configuration of this block. Um, if it goes false before we get to the predetermined value, it'll reset and stop. Program time, uh, again, maybe by a different name, but the, any block in any system will still have this part. And it's a preset time or a program time, uh, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 500 seconds, 2 milliseconds, whatever it is. This is a configurable value that we put in when we are making a program. Elapsed time is uh, exactly like it sounds like it. It's a, a signal that gives you what the elapsed time is based on how long the timer has been timing. And then Q represents our output uh, in a 
it's true if the elapsed time is greater than or equal to the program time. So I start my timer if this is five seconds at five seconds, this one will become true and then we can then use that signal to turn on a light or a horn or whatever it happens to be. We could also use the elapsed time output to turn on an output while it's counting and then once it's done counting it'll turn off so there's usually a couple of different ways that you can use these um, these blocks or these elements so if we look at the timing diagram and you're going to see a million of these timing diagrams and the, a large portion of the plc course is being able to understand uh, what is going on in a program and the way that we can verify that you understand what's going on in a program is through a timing diagram. So let's quickly review uh, what's going on this in this timing diagram here. So we start out, our input is false. And we'll say that we have a button out here that we have to press. When we press the button, this becomes true, which energizes our timer and starts our timer timing. We'll say that uh, our program time is five seconds, let's say for argument's sake, We'll call our program time five seconds. So what happens? We're sitting here idle right now. The button's not pressed and nothing, nothing is going on. Our output Q is not energized because nothing is going on. Our elapsed time is zero because the timer block hasn't been energized by a, a signal. So there we are. We're sitting here at zero and nothing's going. At time T1, I press a button. And it starts the timer. Let's call it the start timer button. The start timer button starts timing and it's going to start counting. So our elapsed time starts to increase, starts to increase, starts to increase, starts to increase. At time T2, which in this case we'll call five seconds, at five seconds our program time is equal to our elapsed time and at that point our output Q would become true. This would, this would energize and it would, and it would stay true. Once I take my finger off the timer button, it becomes false. When it becomes false, Q de-energizes, the counter resets back to zero, and we're sitting there idle waiting for something else to happen. At time T4, I press the timer start button again. The timer starts counting again. I wait two or three seconds and then when ah, I don't feel like doing this anymore, I take my finger off the button, take my finger off the button right here and the timer stops counting and resets. Is that a good enough explanation for you? I'm going to take yep. Yep. silence and yes. Okay, perfect. So that's very simple explanation of kind of what's going on with the timer and what these timing diagrams do but you're going to see timing diagrams and much more complicated diagrams as we move forward here so hopefully you're not uh not deep bewildered at this point all right so let's look at a program here that is a little bit more complicated something that's more more real life here so here we have a switch out in the field what's happening the switch is open, so therefore, this is going to be off because it's an examine on instruction. When this switch closes, this turns green. When this turns green, it energizes the timer input and the timer is going to start timing. We can see here from the block, and this is configurable when we do the programming, you set this value, it's going to time for five seconds. So as long as this switch is closed, it's going to count up to five. Once it gets to five, this Q is going to energize and it's going to turn something off. While it's counting, we're going to have the actual real-time value indicated by this bit here. And you can see we're not using it. And with lots of these blocks, there will be options uh, that you can use and there will be options that you don't have to use. So keep that in mind as we go along here. So as we're sitting here idle, the switch is open, which means that nothing is going on. Uh, our timer hasn't finished timing, therefore Q is not energized. Q is not energized here. The switch down here, which is the same switch by address, input card number three, slot or channel zero. Nothing's happening there, so these are going to be white. This is going to be white. This is going to be white. But this bit right here, because it's, it's an examine off instruction, 
because we haven't achieved our program time and this is not energized, this is going to be green. Okay, so we got to keep that in your head right now that this is going to be green. And if we uh, look at that here, forget it, doesn't matter. All right, so close the switch. What happens? Close the switch, this turns green, this automatically turns green, right? So if this is green and timer T1Q, the timer uh, on delay has not been met, this is also going to be green. So as soon as I touch this switch, this is green. This is already green as it sits in its idle state. So the light's going to come on. Okay, timer one, the light's going to come on. At the same time that this light comes on, because we've energized this run, which is tied to this switch, this is going to start counting for five seconds. It counts for five seconds, one, two, three, four, five. At that point in time, T1Q is going to become true, which means that this is going to turn green, and this is going to change from green to not green, which means that this light is going to turn off, and this light is going to turn on. Does that make sense? That's without looking at the timing diagram below. So let's see what that looks like here. So false, nothing happens. I turn on the switch, the switch becomes true. The input to the timer becomes true. So it starts doing its job. It hasn't counted to five yet. So we're not, the cue is still false. But as soon as I touch that start button, as I said here, that makes this run true and light one turns on. Light two is still off because the timer is not fulfilled its preset, it times for five seconds. Once that five seconds happens, timer Q becomes true. Timer uh, one Q examine off becomes false. This light turns off, this light turns on. So this light turns off here, this light turns on. That happens as the timer one Q becomes energized indicated here. Hopefully, you guys follow along with that because that is a good chunk of this course. Any questions at this point? Good. I like it. All right. So here's another one. This one here is a warning siren on a, on a conveyor system. And part of wrapping your brain around uh, all types of programming is really kind of having an understanding of what's going on. Um, the benefit here is that the ILM will explain to you what the what the process is and trying to do programming without understanding what the process is, is an absolute recipe for disaster. So the first thing I like to do myself and as students, you should try to do too, is look at the ladder diagram and see if you can just kind of make sense of what it is that they're trying to achieve here with, with the program. So when I look at it, I see I have a conveyor here and I have a siren here. So to me, this says I have a stop start station that goes on here. I have a latch that's tied to this first rung that's going to turn on my timer. When my timer is not fulfilled, has not met its preset, most of this run is going to be true. So this is sitting here at idle right now, green. This is the only part of it right now. Um, oh, sorry, this will be green because the timer queue is not fulfilled. And the stop, because this stop switch is closed, this will be also green. So we're sitting here with this green. We're sitting here with this green. I press the button. If I press this button, this will become true and it'll turn green. So this is green, this is green. That means we have flow from this side to this side. That'll turn latch one green. When latch one turns green, that'll turn this latch one green. It'll also turn this latch one green. It'll also turn this latch one green. So when this one turns green, of course, it energizes the timer. The timer starts timing for 10 seconds. This is green because the start button is pressed. This is not green. I mean, this is green because the timer hasn't finished counting, which means that the siren is going to be blaring for 10 seconds. Once that 10 seconds passes, Q becomes true. This run, this bit becomes false. This bit becomes true. And when this bit becomes true, 
it turns on the conveyor. So essentially what we have here is a system where we press the start button, a siren comes on for 10 seconds to warn every, everybody to get off the conveyor belt if they're sleeping, because it's gonna start in 10 seconds. 10 seconds happens, the siren turns off, and the conveyor starts. If at any time I press the stop button, this contact will break. That'll turn this from true to false. That will de-energize this entire rung, which will de-energize this rung, which will de-energize this rung, and we'll turn everything off and reset the counter. And we could walk through that if you wanted to, but that's what's represented here in this time for timing diagram. So that's a good portion of what you're going to be looking at as we move forward here. So um, if you're having a little trouble uh, following through here, it's very fundamental that you understand this. So as you go through these, um, don't skip them if you're having problems with them. Getting winded just sitting here. All right. So here's another application. And you'll notice from the ILMs here that these are, they intend to try to be some real world type applications. So lots of us have maybe seen situations like this. And the joy about programming is that someone's probably done it already. And the, the uh, community of programmers out there are usually really good at helping each other out. So there's not many programs that you'll have to write from scratch. Uh, like if you were looking for a motor start stop program, for example, they're out there everywhere and you can basically just copy and paste them. Um, at any rate. All right, so here's a different type of uh, system here. Delayed motor start. So this is not really different than the delayed conveyor start that we had here, but we're still using a, a timer here. So uh, this example comes with a, a unique circumstance here. So we have uh, a particular system here. What, what does it look like we have? We have, it says delayed motor start, but sure, what does that, what does that mean? And we, I don't really know at this point, right? So let's figure out what's going on here. I have a loop motor and I have a main motor. So this is a pretty standard setup for something that you'd find in Alberta, uh, a, a gas compressor, for example. You go to start a gas compressor, uh, the lube motor will start up, it'll build up oil pressure uh, within the compressor. Once the oil pressure switch is made, then the main motor for the compressor can start. So that's basically what we're looking at here. So we have a pressure switch indicating the oil pressure uh, on, let's say, a compressor. And then we have a start and stop button for the, the compressor itself. So what happens um, when I press the start button? And I guess the question we want to keep in the back of our heads is how does this timer help with possible sensor chatter produced by pressure switch one? So if I didn't have a timer, let's imagine that this timer doesn't exist. I hit the start button. This stop button's green because it's already closed. Start button's not green because the switch is open. I close this switch. This turns green. This is green. This is green. This turns on the lube motor. This energizes. Therefore, this energizes. And therefore, this energizes. So my lube motor starts, starts pumping. Okay, my oil pressure comes up a little bit. This switch closes. And when this pressure switch closes, this will become green. This is already green. If I don't have a timer, this isn't even here. So then the motor turns on. If for some reason the pressure drops for a little bit for a split second, uh, you know, the pump pulsates, for example, this switch opens again, this becomes false, the main motor shuts off. So here we have a situation where the motor started for a split second and then shut off. And then the next time the uh, loop pump pumps and builds pressure, that switch closes again, the main motor turns on, and then maybe it turns off again. So we call that chatter. So to eliminate chatter, we can put this timer in here. So now what happens is we press the start button, the lube motor comes on, this energizes this run, this energizes the lube motor output down here, and pressure starts building up in the pressure switch. We, we meet a minimum amount of pressure with the pressure switch, the pressure switch closes, the timer starts timing. Now, nothing's going to happen until the output of this timer becomes energized down here. So this switch 
can come off and on, off and on, off and on as many times as it wants to, but this isn't going to energize until that switch is closed for five seconds, meaning that we've got adequate lube oil pressure. Once we get adequate lube oil pressure, Q will energize. This will turn green. This is already green. The pressure switch is holding. It will also be green. Then our motor will turn on. So do we all understand how that's working? I just want to make sure that my explanation is reasonably good. Don't expect you to be questioning. Shoot. So actually, when I look at this timer, um, yeah. if this one's turned into two, even though your elapsed time is greater than your program time, and because they still stay in the two state, would that mean even your Q output has been energized, but the elapsed time will continue to increase? will be way bigger than your program time and the continuous increase until your uh, time status turn into off. Is that correct? When I looked at your previous diagram, your in state is staying at the true until something or condition changes, such That's as right. your PS1 yeah. is disabled, isn't it? I, I believe the elapsed time would continue to accumulate as long as the input to the timer would be true uh, yeah. regardless regardless of whether q becomes uh whether regardless of whether q is energized or not but yeah. once we once we lose the input to the timer q will reset and the elapsed time will also reset that's correct but yeah. if for if the status of the yin stays at the two, the elapsed time will continue to increase, even though they're already greater than the program time. Is that correct? I believe that is correct, and we could verify that in the we could verify that in the lab. But yeah, I believe that would be true. It doesn't matter because we're not using this bit at all anyway. But yes, you you could use this as an elapsed time. Uh, for example, if you wanted to use this value to tell you how long the compressor was running. You could do that. So yeah, yes. just curious. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So next level stuff here. We've got two timers. So we have timer one and we have timer two. Um, and this this example is a flasher. So flashing a flashing light here. We have a flashing light. So we have a pressure switch that is open right now. We have a timer two Q, which is untrue so if this is not uh, the time has not equaled its preset time which at this point in time if we're sitting here idle this would not be true so this would be green and this one uh, timer 1q would also uh, not be true but this would not be green because it's an examined on instruction so there so what you're seeing here is when one is on the other one's off when this one's on, that one's off. And that's how we get the flasher thing going on here. So what's happening as we sit here uh, initially? Timer one is false, timer two is false, the pressure switch is false, and therefore the light is also false. So I press, uh, the pressure switch fulfills itself, closes, uh, closes here. This is already green because it's not uh, the Q value is not fulfilled. It has not met its preset. So this is already green. So this is going to start this timer. This timer is going to go for one second, at which point in time, timer one Q is going to energize. Once timer one Q energizes, this is going to energize this bit and energize this bit. And this is already energized when we close the pressure switch. So this light is going to come on. Once, oh, now I'm getting myself confused here. Once timer one Q, oh, I've lost myself here, boys and girls. Sorry about that. It looks like that timer two is what energizes that top rung, right? Yes. So when this is, when this is uh, timing, this is on. When this is met its preset, this turns off. And that's how we get 
this pulse going on here. So timer 2Q energizes very quickly for a second. As you see right here, energizes very quickly for a second, which turns off this bit, which in essence starts the counting all over again for this one. So turns on that bit for a second, which causes this room to go false. It starts timing for a second. Once it's done its timing for a second, the light comes on for a second. Then the other timer becomes true for a quick pulse and it continues to do that as we go on and on and on. So not every single one of these ladder diagrams you you absolutely you don't have to memorize them, but you do have to you, you do have to try to relate them uh, to the timing diagrams here. Okay, so that's a flasher. That's not a very common application that you're going to see in the field anyway, but uh, a good example to show you how you can use two timers to uh, to make a flasher should you ever want to make a flasher. Okay, next thing here we're going to talk about is called a retentive timer and a retentive timer as the name might imply means that when the status of the input to the timer changes the uh, elapsed time does not reset back to zero uh, a great example of why you would want to use a retentive timer uh, i kind of mentioned earlier is if you want to uh, keep track of the amount of time a compressor has been running for example uh, maybe you have a, a two or three uh, compressors in a train and you want to distribute the work amongst them so you know Monday Tuesday is compressor one Wednesday Thursday is compressor two Friday Saturday Sunday is compressor three or or whatever or maybe uh, every 3,000 hours you're going to do an oil change on the compressor and you want to know how long it is run for uh, you would use a retentive timer to keep track of that time and we'll see examples as we go along so again uh, uh, the block itself will vary from manufacturer to manufacturer, but it'll have a certain number of variables that we have to deal with here. So in the case of a retentive timer, we have something that's new, which is uh, in generic terms an enable input. We have our standard input that we had before. We have our preset time and our elapsed time and our, uh, our output, essentially. So the only thing in here is this. Um, enabled thing and you'll see how this comes into play in a second but basically this has to be true before that can be true we'll see how that works out okay so here's a little data table the first data table that we've looked at here and this helps us look at the different uh combinations here so combination a if enable is false and the input is false it's going to retain whatever value is in the elapsed time if Enable is false and the input is true, it's still going to retain the value. If enable is true and the input is false, it's going to reset to zero. And if enable is true and the input is also true, it's going to continue to time. Once you see some exa examples of this, it will be uh, a little easier to understand. Okay, so here's, uh, here's the example. So this is a compressor, uh, basically. And the service light. So after X number of uh, hours, in this case here on this timer, eight hours, after eight hours, we want the service light to come on to say, hey, this compressor's been running for eight hours, time to change to compressor number two or whatever it, whatever it happens to be. So the question that they're asking here, according to the ILM, we're pushing the reset button, clear the elapsed time in this example. So let's see what that means looking at the diagram. So we're going to start, stop, makes sense for a compressor. We also have a new button here, a reset button. So normally close button, normally close button, normally open button. So as we're sitting here, idle, the stop button, because it's closed, is green. The reset button, because it's closed, is green. This one is uh, not green. Then we press the start button. So we press the start button. This is green, this is green. The compressor turns on. Lots for the compressor here energizes, so now the, the compressor is running. The compressor is running, so we get a full path through here that turns on this enable bit. OK, 
okay? Reset is a closed switch, so this is green. The compressor is running, so this is green. This turns on the enable or the uh, input to the timer, so then the timer is going to start counting time. Once this is counting uh, its time, it will continue to count up to up to eight hours. At the same time that's happening, the compressor one, all these compressor ones are energized. So while that's energized, we have an on light saying that the compressor is on. Once we reach eight hours of runtime, this timer output Q will become true. That will energize this bit, which will turn on the service light. Okay, that's the basic, the basic operation of it. That, that would be what happened. So the question is, will pushing the reset button clear the elapsed time in this example? So the reset button over here is uh, currently do, 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 currently uh, false. If I press this reset button, what happens? Don't know. Does it reset it? The answer is the answer is yes. It will re it will reset the it will reset the timer. Just another example. Okay. Uh, oh, so this is these were all on on delays or retentive on. I do want to acknowledge the fact that some of this might be a little bit overwhelming. This is a lot, uh, a lot to ask in 45 minutes of understanding it. Um, we will be able to do live examples of this kind of stuff so that you can kind of, so you can kind of see what happens. Uh, it'll make a lot more sense after that. Um, I will try to get something set up for you guys so that you can, you can kind of play around uh, with this stuff. I feel like most of it is uh, like easy to understand, but the thing that I'm having trouble with right now is just the concept of like you'll have a normally open contact in my eyes from the electrician side, but that's uh, that's not true. Like that stop button on the first rung, uh, like it looks like a normally open contact. So in my eyes, I feel like that's ringing true when that stop button is open, but it's opposite. Yeah, yeah, uh, and you know what I because i'm dual ticketed just like you i have i have the exact same problem in my i have the exact same problem that you do in my head yeah like I, so it's I, I, counterintuitive I, like the, the you notice know, so i got to the re, i got to the reset button and i kind of stumbled because when i when i go between here and between here it short circuits my brain yeah yeah right? exactly yeah you're absolutely right that's going to be your number that'll be your number one problem too because it's even even now after all these years it still causes my brain to short circuit yeah fair enough yeah. all right so those are all uh on timers we have off delay timers which are exactly the same thing as a on delay timer except of course they're they're backwards once it's uh once it's uh meets this thing it turns off so as soon as it gets a signal it turns on and then after that it turns off so same kind of deal as far as parameters for the, the block itself we have the input we have a program time we have q which represents the output and we also have our elapsed time so what happens uh in a in a time off delay timer here so the input is false suddenly the input becomes true so as it as it's sitting here right now the output is is energized already Okay, it's energized, the timer is already timing. I click that input to true, it, it drops off the elapsed timer and it, it is off. It resets back to zero. When I'm true, once I go false again, it starts to time, 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 time until it meets its uh, Q value. And once its Q value is met, it turns off. Simple, simple as that is the opposite of an on. Okay, so here's an example for an off delay program. And I do expect you to be able, of course, walk through these and understand the timing diagrams, but it's also an important thing to you kind of to understand uh, where the different types of 
ladder logics are used for in terms of processes. So like the previous one, we looked at a, a, a compressor uh, that we wanted to have a timer on so that we knew how long it was running cumulatively. Uh, here we have an example of a cooling fan that's on for two minutes after the motor shutdown. So these are all common examples that we would see out in a facility somewhere. So keep that in mind because this is, you can really relate this to stuff that you uh, see in the real world. And if you just think about the way things work at work, you can probably come back to this and go, okay, I get it. I press the stop button. It's just like turning off your turbocharged vehicle, right? You've been driving your turbocharged vehicle for six hours. They say you don't want to just, you know, throw it and drive and turn it off. You're supposed to sit there for 30 seconds and let things cool down. So same kind of idea here, but on an industrial scale. So the application of this particular piece of programming says that we want the cooling fan to be on for two minutes after the motor shuts down. So we have to understand what happens. So stop button is uh, closed right now. So this is going to be green as we sit here idle. Everything else is going to be off at this point in time. So I press the start button. That turns this green. This is green. This is green. That turns this green. That turns this green. That turns this green. That turns this green. That turns the motor also green so the motor starts okay the motor's running 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 motors motors running the timer is timing uh is is uh this is energized so this is doing it's doing nothing technically at this point in time we press the stop button that uh breaks this breaks this oh what the hell am i gonna do here i'm i lost myself again this is time uh, when this goes false. Once I press the stop button, this will go false. It'll lose its signal here. It will then time for two minutes. Once this two minutes elapses, Q becomes true. This rung becomes true and the fan will run for two minutes. Very easy to get confused as you walk through these, uh, especially if you haven't looked at them for a little while. So those are timers, timer on and timer off. And again, uh, you're not gonna be experts by any means uh, by looking at PowerPoint slides. You will get a little bit better once we get to do some hands-on, uh, but you probably won't be good at this unless you do this full time for quite a while. Okay, up counter. We're about two, three, two thirds of the way uh, through the presentation now. So we're getting there. So up counter, so we have count up and that'll preclude the fact that we will also have a countdown timer, which will be the opposite of this as we go forward. So some of the variables you'll see, the count up uh, input, it says if it's a rising edge, it increases the internal count, which rising edge means if it's going from a zero to a one, it's gonna increase the count. Okay, the PV is our program count value. So whatever, however number of counts that we want. The R is a reset, so, um, when this becomes true, it's going to reset our counted value back down to zero. We have Q, which is still our output, which will become true if our uh, counted value is equal to our preset value. And then, of course, we have the reset, reset button here, so different things. Okay, so sitting here, uh, false, I sitting here false, I get a count up positive pulse. I get a count up positive pulse it increases our counter value up by one. Okay, every time this becomes true, it increases this value by one until I get to a certain preset. In this case, the preset uh, looks to be, what was that, one, two, three, four, five. Once I hit five right here is our preset value. Once our preset value is equal to our counted value, which would be five, we are gonna get Q becoming energized. Q is then energized. We can we can keep counting. It keeps counting until it stays energized. It's energized and it continues to count. Our CV is going to continue to rise every time the button gets pressed until such a time that I press the reset button. When I press the reset button here, it resets everything back down to zero and it starts going again. Every time we get a pulse from the counter, another pulse right here, it starts counting over and over again. Before somebody asks, is there such a thing as a retentive counter? 
Yes, there is. We'll get to that eventually. Okay, so here's an up counter program. Um, here we have, uh, what do we have here? We have some type of a counter that energizes a, a solenoid. And here we have a proximity switch underscore can proximity switch underscore box. So what that tells me is every time a can comes by a proximity switch, I'm going to count it. And after a certain number of cans, I'm going to, that'll fill a box. I'm going to count a box or I'm going to say the box is full. Let's reset the counter. So can comes by proc switch, proc switch goes true. It counts up. We're going to count up until 12. Once we get to 12, Q is going to become true. Okay, so comes off and on, off and off, off and on, off and on, off and on, off and on. We hit 12. At the point we hit 12, the box is full. The box switch gets made. This becomes true. Resets our counter. Also energizes the uh, also energizes Q. Once we hit 12, we have energized Q. Once we energize Q, it energizes this bit, which turns on a solenoid, which will kick the box down the line or whatever it happens to do uh, at the same time then resetting the counter and then continues to do it over again. So we're filling the box with 12 objects and then moving it down the line. Okay, down counter, uh, same idea, same variables. Um, this one here has uh, a load variable here, which resets the counted value to the preset value when true. So this is the opposite of the count up timer. Uh, I will tell you right now that with um, Alan, Bradley, Alan Bradley's logics program, uh, the count up, count down are both in the same are both in the same block. They don't have individual blocks like we're showing here. So you'll have a an input that's for CU as well as for CD in the same block. But we can't uh, obviously train you on everybody's individual system. So this is just kind of a generic thing for you. Okay, so countdown, whenever of course this becomes true, it's gonna count down to a certain preset value. So let's see what that looks like in, in real life here. So we have a parquet program. Every time a card, a card comes in, it's going to count up every time a uh, car goes out. It's going to count down at any point during the day. If I don't feel like working, I press the full button. If I press the full button, it's going to transfer the preset value to the load and satisfy Q and turn on the full light. If I ever, when I hit the empty button, it's going to reset the count up value back down to zero so that we can keep counting. I don't know if I need to go farther into it than that or not. Probably not. So let's just say our preset value here is 200. So this goes up and down 200 times. Once it hits 200, the Q light comes on. Once the Q light comes on, parking lot's full. Somebody hops in their car and they drive out. Uh, oh, they drive out, there it is, they drive out, the out switch energizes, it counts it down by one, it'll change the value of this back down to 199, also this value back to 199 so we can take another car, the full light will turn off and we can go on and on all day long. Uh, if any, time, any point in time I need to have a nap, I press the full button here. The full button will energize the load, which will take this value and compare it to this value, which would be full. That will energize uh, the Q, which will turn on the full light. If I, at any point in time, hit the empty button, it's going to reset the counter back down to zero, which is going to turn off Q, which will turn off the full light. Marvelous, right? Okay, this is uh, up-down instruction. This is kind of what Rockwell does or sorry, Alan Bradley does with their uh, system. They kind of combine it into both. So we have count up, count down, reset, load, preset value, Q for the up count, Q for the down count, and our accumulated uh, variable, or our current variable. 
every different system will have different kinds of blocks with different types of functionality. So this is very generic. What kind of issues can we have with counters? So depending on manufacturers, again, some of these restrictions may apply, some of them may not apply. So some things that you may uh, come across depending on the system that you're working with, uh, count restrictions, count overflow and underflow, count restarts values, and count frequency limits. So these are things that you have to be concerned with with a specific vendor uh, software that you're using. So what is the counter restriction? Uh, does the counter stop counting at a preset value or, or zero? Like, it's just one of these things that you gotta look for. Uh, overflow or underflow, what happens if my preset value is 200 and I get to 201, what does it do? Uh, if it counts over, it's called overflow. Uh, if we're in a count down timer and we get down to zero and we have someone else leave the parkade, will it go to negative one? We have to, we have to know that. Um, restart value, is the current value retentive? So that usually is addressed in a retentive timer versus a normal timer. Um, but some systems are different, so you have to know what your system does. Does it retain that value or does it turn it down to zero? Uh, count frequency limits. So this is, a, this is another one. Some, some systems uh, can handle really high frequency transitions between one and zero. Uh, some can't handle very fast transitions. So these are all issues that you kind of have to be aware of when you're dealing with counters. All right, uh, I should have updated this diagram because I probably have a new one already. Uh, this is kind of an example of that solenoid can counting, uh, can counting thing that we looked at a few slides ago where it counted 12 cans and then put them into a box and then kicked the box away. Um, this particular diagram is something that you're going to want to focus on because I do have this as basically one of the labs uh, that we do uh, minus this second part here. But basically the lab that we make you do is we make you count a certain number of cans, energize a solenoid valve uh, every time a can comes by to kick it into a box. Then once the box gets 12 things in it, we energize this solenoid valve to kick this box onto a conveyor and then we can repeat the process. So this is the Molson Canadian uh, beer line. So 12 beers in a box, kick the box down here. Once the box is full, we go on there. So this will accommodate counting up of all the bottles that come down the line from over here. We have a provision here for uh, counting uh, down as well, uh, empty, full, basically everything what we've looked at up till now is including in this, included in this sorting program. Make sure that you understand this one because you are going to be doing this as a lab. Okay, motor lockout program here. Just another example. I'm not going to walk you all the way through this. Uh, those of you who are electricians uh, and did the PLC section in that uh, in that trade class will probably uh, maybe will remember this. Um, instrument guys probably not so much, but electricians uh, this magical overload is in here uh, as well. And what the lockout program uh, does basically is limits the amount of times uh, that you can either try to start things or the amount of runtime that you can have uh, on uh, a motor. So I'm not going to walk you through every single uh, every single one of these. But basically, this one is saying that uh, you can run this motor for 12 hours and you can have basically uh, four attempts at starting it before it doesn't let you start it anymore. Okay, so in summary for our first ILM and PLCs here, almost all PLCs use ladder logic programming. The standard outlining uh, the operation for ladder logic is IEC 61131-3. Not all manufacturers follow it exactly, but they're all pretty darn close. Um, you'll notice that the names of some of the instructions and the configurations of timers and counters are somewhat different from the ILMs to the control logic PLCs in the labs. 
So that is the first ILM there. And let's just see if I can show you something else here. Uh, push content. I thought I had lab videos in here, but it doesn't look like I do. So I guess I'm not going to show you that. 